James, what's going on? He's my hero. He's oh. my hero. <laughs> there you guys John, are. You're, you're a magnificent human being, and I so admire you. And, of course, you're exactly right. As you would know, as our premier American pilot, perhaps the greatest pilot in, in the history of the world, uh, the ACARS was used by pilots for 9-11 Truth to track Flight 93 and discover that it was over Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, after it had purportedly crashed in Shanksville, and also to track Flight 175 and determine it was over Harrisburg and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, long after it had allegedly hit the South Tower. I obtained uh, FAA registration records that showed that the planes used for those Flights, where, of course, uh, the same plane could be used for many different flights today from Tampa to Chicago, tomorrow from New York to San Francisco, were not uh, deregistered or formally taken out of service until 28 September 2005, which since uh, flights 11 and 77 were not even in the air, according to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics records, which had did not have them listed. How can planes that weren't even in the air have crashed on 9-11? And how can planes that crashed on 9-11 have still been in the air four years later? Right. Of, of course, a uh, half a dozen or more of these uh, pilots of Michael turned up alive and well and made contact with the British press the following day as, as David Ray Griffin makes his very first point in his magisterial, the 9-11 commission report, omissions and distortions. Uh, John, of course, says he may have already reported, gave a, a masterful uh, affidavit for uh, a 9-11 lawsuit in New York in which he explained that it was aerodynamically impossible for Boeing 767s to fly at the speed that, uh, that is reflected in these videos, so we know something was terribly wrong. And, of course, that it was a physical impossibility for them to have entered those massive 500,000-ton steel and concrete structures, given their design, where the uh, purported Flight 11, whatever was simulating, was intersecting with seven different floors. Flight 175 with eight, where each of the floors consisted of a steel tr truss connected at one end to the core columns, at the other to the massive external steel support columns and filled with four to eight inches of concrete. Because the buildings are 208 feet on a side, that meant each of the floors represented an acre of concrete on a steel truss, as John can affirm, we know what happens when a commercial carrier or other plane in flight encounters a small bird weighing a few ounces. Just imagine a carrier encountering a, 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 an acre of concrete on a steel truss. It would have been obliterated. And had those been real planes, they would have crumpled external to the building. Uh, their parts, their bodies, their wings, tail, seats, luggage would have fallen to the ground. We have, in fact, photographs of the ground, the roadway, the sidewalks beneath those facades, and they're completely bereft of any airplane parts. We do have an engine that was planted at the intersection of Church and Murray that was an antiquated engine no longer in service, where Jack White, a legendary photo and film analyst uh, with whom I collaborated on uh, JFK and many other issues, discovered Fox News footage of a white van at the intersection where uh, four or five men wearing FBI vests were unloading something heavy. It's sitting on the sidewalk. It's beneath a steel scaffolding and a canopy. Had anything that massive hit at high velocity, it would have done massive destruction to the sidewalk, which is completely undamaged. And they even left behind a dolly, which they appear to have used in, in moving it into position. I'm glad I don't have to update you, Tim, but I knew I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a delight being here with you, John. I just got to say, when Michael told me that you're going to be on, I was so glad to be able to join you. That's great. Oh, yes. You know, one thing I did notice about 9-11, well, just just the recent, just recently that just gone by here, during September, of course, I, I noticed there was not a lot of emphasis about standing together, staying strong. Uh, nothing of, of that nature existed this time around, like previous years, we were kind of bombarded with all sorts of advertisements about standing together and being strong. Um, this year, we didn't have we didn't have any of that really. Well, it's probably you know, one of the things that uh, uh, people don't know is that when they fired that weapon from orbit, it was the first time they tried it at full power, and. Of course, it destroyed everything, and uh, several months later, when they started to rebuild, I think the uh, 
uh, the uh, Deutsche Bank was the first one they started to rebuild, uh, they would get the steel and concrete up and soon after it would start to disintegrate. So what happened is whatever the specifics of the direct energy weapon was, when they when they released the trigger, it still went on. So what they had to do is make uh, these uh, reflecting pools where World Trade Center 1 and 2 uh, stood uh, because water was the only thing that uh, that could be there and not, not just be disintegrated. And uh, that's why they put the reflecting pools there. They may, they may have used uh, directed energy weapons, as John is suggesting. We have found that the... Uh, U.S. Geological Survey conducted dust studies from 35 locations in Manhattan and discovered a host of elements that, that would not have been present had this not been a, a, a nuclear event. So it may be that they combine methodologies. We have barium and strontium, thorium and uranium, tritium, uh, uh, lithium, lanthanum. I mean, some of these only exist in radioactive form. And, of course, we did have this massive molten metal that was uh, there until the 1st of December, which required incredibly high heat. I mean, there's no question whatsoever that this was not done by the impact of jet planes. Uh, jet fuel uh, would not have burned long enough or hot enough to cause uh, any uh, steel to weaken, uh, much less melt. Uh, in fact, the building's uh, steel structure uh, function as enormous heat sink. Underwriters Laboratories had certified the steel used in the building to 2,000 degrees for three to four hours. Uh, the South Tower, we only had these very modest fires uh, for about an hour. In the North, about an hour and a half, and their temperature was dramatically less than what could possibly have made any effect on the steel. And while we witnessed the buildings blowing apart in every direction from the top down and being converted into millions of cubic yards of very fine dust, when it's done in their footprints, there is nothing, no stack of debris. Striking contrast to Building 7, which, of course, was a 47-story structure that came down at 520, about seven hours after the destruction of, of the North Tower had occurred, uh, where it, too, uh, had only extremely modest fires. In fact, it's it's a classic example of a controlled demolition. All the floors are coming down at the same time. They're not blowing apart. The building isn't being converted into uh, cubic yards of, of dust. And when it's over, there's the, the typical outcome of a controlled demolition, namely a stack of debris equal to approximately 12% of the height of the original, or in that case, five and a half floors. Had there been a collapse of the Twin Towers, you would have had, you know, 12% of 110 floors, which would have been about 13 and a half or 14 floors, but there was nothing there. In fact, I had uh, uh, Father Frank Morales from St. Mark's Episcopal Church in the vicinity who was a first responder on my own radio shows twice, and on both occasions he explained how those buildings were destroyed to or even below ground level. Yes, and... Uh... What uh, what happened with Building 7 and the reason it happened uh, seven hours later was there was supposed to be an airplane crash into Building 7 or uh, supposedly crash. Uh, they, they were all holograms. Uh, but whatever they had was, for some reason, not operational. It broke or for some reason they couldn't use it. And so they waited seven hours and, and they said, well, what are we going to do? And they said, well... I guess we can just uh, destroy it anyway, and maybe people will be dumb enough to think that, you know, that it just happened like that. This is wild stuff, by the way. Look, you know, Larry Zilberstein actually gave an interview to PBS in which he explained that he'd been in a conversation with the ER. He gave this verbal pause, fire commander, which I interpret to mean he knew this guy under another designation as well, and that there'd been so much death and devastation, perhaps the best thing to do was to pull it which, of course, is a construction term for bringing down by controlled demolition. He said they made the decision to pull, and we watched it come down. Uh, Barry Jennings, by the way, who is from the New York Emergency Management uh, uh, Unit, uh, John, was in the building, in Building 7. He went there because uh, Rudy Giuliani had his own command and control center, two floors with their own air and water. Right. When he got when he got up there, he found uh, half-eaten sandwiches, still steaming cups of coffee. A fireman came along and said, we got to get you out of here. 
explosions were going on while he was inside the building. A stairwell was blown out from under him. At one point, he felt himself stepping over bodies. He couldn't see them, but he could feel them. When he got out, he was interviewed. You can still find his interviews online and explain what he'd been through uh, just before. And as you well know, of course, the report uh, of the 9-11 Commission did not even mention Building 7. They were forced to conduct a separate investigation. And just before its release, I'm talking about within days, Barry Jennings died mysteriously. Here was a guy who could have, based upon his own direct personal experience, have contradicted the official account. I think he was, uh, therefore, an inconvenient witness. And as we know, in so many other cases, uh, they tend to have abbreviated lifespans. Yep, they go away yeah, mysteriously. Yeah. And now the uh, the same weapon, direct energy, uh, is used in uh, Santa Rosa. I'm not sure if you've seen the videotapes, but there was absolute total destruction there. And they have pictures of the uh, of the rays, the, the blue rays coming down and uh, starting the fires. Uh, there was no reason to be to have 85 mile per hour uh, mile per hour winds there. Uh, and those, of course, were created by um, by the weapons in space, as was Katrina, uh, Harvey, and all the other hurricanes. They've always been uh, they were contrived. They were uh, um, made by these uh, weapons. So you John, we're on exactly the same page. Went for off. The, the fires uh, in had, California. Uh, we had a hurricane. Uh, 100 miles off the coast of Manhattan that was used uh, in some fashion uh, to help these uh, direct energy weapons uh, uh, work. Yeah, Judy's never been very clear about the role of Hurricane Aaron, but I'm completely in agreement with you about these recent hurricanes having been man-made. I interviewed James McCanny about it. The other experts have drawn the same conclusion, and the fires in California are bizarre, and I agree 100% appear to be caused by directed energy weapons. You have cases where buildings and all of their contents, I mean, you know, their, 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 their bathroom fixtures, ceramic fixtures, steel structures and all that are completely decimated, and yet... Trees growing right beside them are completely unaffected. It's very Absolutely. weird. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, fires growing inside the trees. Uh, that may be because uh, there, there's a phenomenon where the, the trees dry out on the inside. So that may or may not be, you know, and therefore can burn from the inside. That may or may not be supportive evidence, but it's certainly striking. And I wonder whether you entertain the hypothesis that has occurred to me, to wit, uh, Bibi Netanyahu is very pissed off that we did not deliver Syria on a silver platter. He's very upset with the United States. My personal conjecture is that Israel is at war with the United States, that these hurricanes are a manifestation. Remember, their God is not a God of compassion and forgiveness, a, a, a God of love. Their God is a God of revenge. Let vengeance be mine. I even believe that these bizarre ship accidents uh, off of the coast of Japan uh, by American warships that are very sophisticated electronically, that have the capability of knowing everything in the air, on the water, and beneath the water simultaneously 24-7 or constantly maintained as surveillance stations, having collisions with enormous lumbering cargo ships is inconceivable unless they were somehow being electronically uh, micromanaged by manipulating GPS or otherwise. And anyone who thinks that Israel wouldn't have the resources for the technology may be forgetting that on the day before 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld announced that the Pentagon was missing $2.3 trillion from its budget, where the chief financial officer of the Pentagon at the time, Dov Zockheim, was not only a dual U.S.-Israeli citizen, but actually a rabbi, he had a, a, a flight management system company, though they they could remotely take control of an aircraft were it being uh, hijacked. I believe the original plan was to fly drones using those systems into the towers until they discovered it was physically impossible to make the entry. They had to get them all the way inside the building before they exploded to have a pseudo explanation for what they would claim would be the explanation for their collapse, even though at a completely different a causal character. 
Uh, I'm also suspicious about these auditory attacks on the, our embassy in Cuba. I mean, the Cubans have been waiting for more than 50 years for improved relations with the United States. They have no interest whatsoever in doing anything that would undermine. But Israel doesn't like the example of the United States having a reconciliation with a, a communist country or, or formerly and, and doesn't want it to set an example for a rapprochement with Russia, which I hope will yet take place for the Donald, for example, is going to have a meeting with Vladimir Putin in Vienna toward the end of his current trip to five different nations. I believe yeah, that well, Israel is the one country that has the motive and the means and, and, of course, the opportunity to bring these events about to the great detriment of the United States. Well, now, Israel was definitely responsible, totally and completely responsible for Fukushima. There's no doubt about that. And uh, now that they started to release the Kennedy information, they will never, ever find out or release to the public that Mossad was the one that uh, assassinated uh, Kennedy, and they did that on the uh, on the um, direct orders of um, uh, I'm trying to think who the prime minister was then, uh, David Ben Gurion, uh, and he resigned. That was in the summer of '63 when he gave them the order, and then they uh, uh, then he resigned. And it took them five months to get the program together. As far as the CIA being involved, the only reason that the that you could say that the CIA was involved is that uh, James, uh, James Jesus Angleton, who was chief of station in Rome and was sent down to Israel in 1947 when the country was being formed, along with M- MI6, to form Mossad. Somehow... Angleton got compromised uh, with Mossad, and when he was sent back to the United States, he was put in charge of foreign intelligence in 1960, and his whole thing, his whole reason, raison d'etre, was he was going to find the Russian mole in the CIA, and the fact was he was the Russian mole. Um, in 1972, he was fired by Bill Colby, a friend of mine, and uh, then Mossad assassinated Bill Colby. So, Angleton, uh, being in the CIA, was the one that greased the skids uh, for Mossad to uh, assassinate Kennedy. Well, I think that uh, the Israel did have a motive because uh, David Ben Gurion was at loggerheads with JFK, who did not want Israel to proceed with the development of nuclear weapons. The absolutely plan- the inspection of Demona is what yeah. uh, Ben Gurion didn't want, and uh, uh- Kennedy kept insisting on it. Uh, the inspection of Demona, and uh, finally Ben Gurion got fed up and just said, "Do him." Well, the fact is that the uh, the plan to assassinate Jack originated in 1960 in Los Angeles when Lyndon Johnson forced himself on the ticket. Uh, Jack had already invited Stuart Simon to Missouri to be his running mate. Uh, Bobby went by the Johnson suite to extend a pro forma invitation, which he expected Lyndon to decline. Was astonished when he jumped on it. He threatened to expose that Jack had Edison's disease, wasn't expected to live a long, healthy life that he had had dalliances with beautiful women, some of whom were spies for East Germany, and moreover, if he were not on the ticket, then any legislative proposal sent down by the White House would be dead on arrival because he'd block them in his position as the powerful Senate Majority Leader. Jack and Bobby tried to figure a way out, but were boxed in and had to accede to Lyndon's request. When one of Lyndon's powerful, wealthy backers learned that he was going to help elect JFK president, he burst into the Johnson suite cursing and swearing. Uh, Bobby Baker took him into a bedroom and explained what they had in mind. He came out all smiles and said he thought that was an excellent plan. Bobby would later declare that Jack would not live out his first term and would die a violent death. Lyndon actually sent his chief administrative assistant, Cliff Carter, down to Dallas to make sure all the arrangements were in place for the assassination. But I certainly agree that Israel, along with the CIA, the Joint Chiefs, anti-Castro Cubans, the Mafia, Eastern establishment surrounding the Feb and the Texas Oilmen were sponsors of the assassination. They wanted JFK out. The mechanics, I've identified six of the shooters. Uh, I'm fairly confident there was a seventh. They had coordinators and supervisor who, astonishingly enough, included George Herbert Walker Bush, who actually was in the Dow Tax, 
supervising a hit team that involved an anti-Castro Cuban by the name of Nestor Tony Escadro, who was using a Manlicher Carcano, the only unsilenced weapon being used in, in the plaza, to set up the acoustical impression of only three shots having been fired. The weapon is so unreliable, having been known in World War II as the humanitarian rifle for never harming anyone on purpose. He did fire three shots, but with two misses, one hit a distant curbing and injured a bystander by the name of James Tague. Another missed and hit the chrome strip above the windshield. After the driver, William Greer, pulled the limousine to the left and to a halt to make sure JFK would be killed, his third shot hit Jack in the back of the head. He slumped forward. Jackie eased him back up, was looking him right in the face when he was hit in the right temple by a frangible exploding bullet fired from the intersection of the triple underpass and the picket fence. There's an above-ground sewer opening there by a soldier of fortune with ties to both the CIA and the mafia by the name of Frank Sturgis. And that that shot uh, blew, set up shockwaves that blew his brains out the back of his already weakened cranium with such force that when they impacted with Motorcycle patrolman Bobby Hargis riding to the left rear. He initially thought he himself had been shot. We, we know, uh, Jack slumped to the left. Now the, the limo stop and the, the two hits, which were very distinct, were such obvious indications of a conspiracy that, and in fact, the, of the Secret Service setting him up, for which we have 15 other indications that they had to take it out. Uh, this was done at a secret CIA lab uh, adjacent to Godak headquarters in Rochester known as Hawkeye Works. So while the original film, as an 8 millimeter already split film, was taken to the National Photographic Interpretation Center in Washington, D.C. on Saturday the 23rd, where they had to ha uh, uh, ask a shop owner to open his store so they could buy an 8 millimeter projector to view it, the substitute was brought as a 16 millimeter unsplit film by an agent who identified him as William Smith to the same location uh, where they had a different crew working on Sunday than had been working Saturday, and the substitution was made. My, my estimate is that uh, while we have 487 frames of the existing film altogether in the original, there would have been about a thousand. They took out. Uh, about a hundred of the the presidential limousine turning from Houston on to Elm, where, by the way, the vehicles were all in the wrong order. The president ought to have been in the middle. This is one of the most telling indications of how they set him up. They put him out front so there'd be less confusion on the part of the shooters as to his location. But the driver swung out too widely, nearly hit a concrete abutment. He had to pause and get back into line, which I think would have shaken the confidence of the American people and the ability of the Secret Service to protect him. Plus, after the driver pulled the limit to the left and to a halt, a lot of activities ensued. Bobby Hargis parked his bike, got off his, uh, ran between the two vehicles, which would have been impossible had they still been in motion up to the grassy knoll because he thought that was the origin of the shot. Officer Douglas Jackson, riding on the right side, actually rode his bike up the grassy knoll until it fell over and then proceeded on foot. Meanwhile, five Secret Service agents surrounded the building. This is the time when Clint Hill rushed forward, by the way. Jackie climbed out on the trunk after a big chunk of Jack's skull and brains. He pushed her back Jim, down and Jim. lay across their bodies and was the first to observe up close and personal a gaping fist-sized hole in the back of JFK's head, obviously a mortal wound, which led him to turn to his colleagues and give him a thumbs down. Meanwhile, one of the agents took a chunk of JFK's skull and threw it back into the vehicle, uh, and then they took off. Hey, Jim, hold, hold, Jim, hold on one second. What, what did you say, John? I want to know how Jim breathes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I get that a lot, John. <laughs> um, to tell you a little bit about how uh, Israel has infiltrated our, our country, I, I write on Facebook, have my page there, John Lear, and uh, I wrote a story a couple of weeks ago uh, about the F-19. Uh, now, the uh, and why they had to kill General Bobby Bonds. Uh, the reason was 
Uh, 19, uh, I think in 1905, Ben Rich was born to a very wealthy family, Jewish family in the Philippines. And uh, when he got to a college age, uh, they sent him to the United States to go to University of California and uh, UCLA and uh, University of California at Berkeley, uh, where he got his engineering degree. And then he was, 1953, he went to work for Lockheed. And uh, he worked his way up. Uh, to go to the Skunk Works, but of course, since you're, if you're not born in the United States, you have to have, uh, you cannot get a top security clearance. That's, that's just a given. So what they did is they fabricated a complete background, uh, to have him born in the United States, gave him a new name of Ben Dover. Now, that was a joke on the uh, intelligence committee, uh, an inside joke that his name was Bend Over and they were going to uh, give him a uh, top security clearance, what they did. He ended up as, uh, in when Kelly Johnson retired in 1975, as head of the Skunk Works. Now, the Skunk Works was then in the process of designing the F-117A. And what uh, Ben Rich did was uh, create the F-19. 32, there were 64 of them made. 32 of them went to Israel. Uh, the rest went to the Navy. And what they did, the, how they did it, is they wanted to see if they could build all 64 of the F-19s without any money, without any money from Congress or the Pentagon. And they pulled it off. And the way they did it is uh, everything that they needed for the f 117A, they ordered uh, a double amount. In other words, if they needed two engines, they ordered four. If they needed uh, uh, two sets of landing gears, they ordered four. Uh, and so they were able to build that airplane without anybody knowing it. Uh, and then accidentally, one day, General Bobby Bonds, who was head of the F-117A program, was in Ben Rich's office, and he saw a door with a lock on it that was specific only to the Navy. And he asked Ben Rich what's in there, and Rich said, I can't tell you. And Bobby Bond said, uh, you tell me, or I'm going to get a crash X, and I'm going to go in there myself. Um, ben Rich had him sign some uh, accidental disclosure forms, let him in, and Bobby Bonds became aware of the F-19 and uh, what was going on there. So that was in 1978. Uh, in 1984, as uh, the airplanes started to come online, the F-117A went to the Air Force, and the F-19 and the F-19 was uh, sent to the uh, Navy and uh, Israel, and they couldn't afford for anything to leak out about this airplane, so they had to kill General Bonds. And the way they did it is where they invited him to Groom Lake. Now, Bonds already had a clearance to go to Groom Lake, but they invited him to Groom Lake to fly the F-19. And uh, Bonds got in the airplane, uh, took off from Groom Lake, headed to the south, and uh, when he got to the uh, uh, the uh, southern limit of the Nevada test site, he started a left turn, and they were able to dis uh, uh, discontrol all of the uh, controls in the airplane, ailerons, except for the elevators, and they pointed that straight down, and General Bonds crashed at 450 uh, miles an hour into Little Skull Mountain there. And that, that solved their problem of... Uh, uh, General Bonds ac uh, accidentally um, t telling anybody about the F-19. Uh, ben Rich was the highest Mossad spy west of the Mississippi uh, to uh, to be in control, and he was the head of the Skunk Works. He knew all of the uh, uh, what was going on, all the secret programs, uh, uh, the whole thing. And I think he died in. 1995, so I don't know who's in control now. Well, we sure agree about the role of Israel here, which is massive. Uh, Cynthia McKinney recently revealed when new members of Congress arrive in Washington, they're asked to sign a pledge right. to put the interests of Israel ahead of those of the United States, and the those impact. who refuse find themselves confronted with a well-financed alternative candidate or that their district has been redrawn and they no longer have a seat. Cynthia was able to overcome those obstacles, but others, even including Dennis Kucinich, have not. I, on two different occasions recently, I was asked how many members of the current Congress have refused to sign that pledge, and I got the same answer from both, namely one, numero uno, exactly one. I mean, it's a complete disgrace. 
JFK, of course, had required its, the uh, pre- precursor of the uh, APAC, the American-Israeli, they call it Public Affairs Committee, Correct. which was a World Jewish Congress to register as a foreign agent, but no president since his assassination has been so bold. They obviously are an agent of a foreign government and by far the most powerful lobby in the United States. When two brilliant scholars, one from Harvard and one from the University of Chicago, published a book about the Israeli lobby, a massive tome, very scholarly, demonstrating conclusively the extraordinary control that uh, Israel exercises over our Congress, they were attacked. The book wasn't praised for a, as a revelation, which, of course, was shedding light on the actual power structure of the United States, but rather they were pilloried for what I suppose they were accused of anti-Semitism or any of the other obvious uh, canards that are thrown at those who expose the role that Israel is exercising on our government. Right. By the way, John, I, I just got a quick question here from one of the listeners. They're asking, how is it that Lear feels safe to talk like this? I always wondered. You know, I've been asked that question so many times. All I can say is I'm probably protected. Now, Uh, I don't know why they should have eliminated me a long time ago because everybody else who even knows less than me and doesn't go around talking about it are wiped out. They're killed. But here I am still still kicking. Still kicking. Right. Now, I'm not in very good health, but uh, I'm still alive. I'm 74 years old. And uh, I, I can't walk anymore, but uh, I spend most of my time uh, posting on uh, Facebook and telling all my stories. John, possibly you and Michael discussed this before, but uh, the, the the holograms that were projected. Oh, yeah. Let, let's get into that, because John to, to, does have a lot. The North and the South Tower. Right. Uh, I even have a page from an Australian manual for an airborne holographic projector. There's a fellow in the U.K., Richard Hall, who's done what he's labeled his uh, uh, Flight 175 of the 3D radar study, where he explains how he arrived at the conclusion. But the projecting plane appears to have been 1,200 feet to the side. It wasn't observed. Apparently, the sound of that plane was mistaken to be the sound of the hologram. Would that have been an F-19? Would it have been a stealth fighter? Uh, the plane was flying, of course, too fast, as you observed in your affidavit already. Do you have an idea as to how it was, uh, you know, what plane was used to project it? Uh, okay, what's the question again? What what uh, plane do you believe could have been used to project the hologram. holograms at the North and the South Tower? Right. Oh, uh, I don't know. I I don't know whether they needed a plane or not. Some people believe oh. it was an E four B. No, 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 no. This is a, a small plane. It wasn't visible from the ground, but he has radar tracks, John, that actually track. The plane projecting the hologram, that was one of the results of his study. He had used the videos, and there were about 52. He found there were like 27 that were sufficiently precise. You could plot the location and time for the plane, for example, 175 approaching the building. He found that uh, NIST had a similar plot they claimed was based on radar data, but it didn't look right to him. He did a study and found there was radar data, but it was for a plane that was 1,200 feet to the side, of course, you're not going to have radar data for a hologram because it's not a physical object that will bounce back radio waves. So there was a real plane flying 1,200 feet to the side that was projecting the hologram to preserve the integrity. It had to fly faster than a Boeing 767 could fly at that altitude, where pilots have also concluded, as uh, you have yourself, that the plane, had it been a real 767 at that speed at that altitude, would have physically come apart. So I'm just speculating on, you know, could it have been a stealth fighter like the F-19 that was used to do the projection? No, they didn't go very fast. They uh, went about uh, Mach 0.85. They they didn't really go that fast. But, uh, you know, they we had holograms back in the early 60s, and it's been de- developed to the point where they can do anything they want. That's how they hide uh, the new secret bases now. The base in northern Nevada where the black triangles fly out of uh, is uh, totally uh, uh, invisible uh, by these uh, uh, 
uh, machines that can uh, they can put in whatever they want uh, as ground cover. For instance, if the uh, if the uh, airplane or if the airport is in a forest, they can make it a forest. If it's in the desert, they can make it a desert. And the pilots tell me that uh, going into these places, their radar vector down to about 200 feet, and then the ground. They said, John, it's like a zipper. If the zipper opens, the field is uh, uh, totally visible. They land, and then the uh, the cover is is uh, zipped back up. The same thing they have for the Nevada test site, which incidentally is now totally uh, has the same security regulations as Area 51. In other words, when you go to work uh, anywhere in the Nevada test site, uh, you get the same stuff. You're weighed going in. Uh, you get facial recognition, eyeball recognition, uh, everything. And so that whole place is being taken over for something. Now, the, uh, the new base that's been in the, built maybe, uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, and I had the fortunate, I was a pilot up at the Nevada test site. Uh, my job was <clears throat> to fly the perimeter of the test site, uh, before the underground nuclear blast. And the reason was that if it vented, I was supposed to fly through the, uh, the vent, the smoke, and take the readings and then take it back to McCarran. So I had a view of a lot that was going on there, not Area 51, but a lot of other things. And one of the things I saw was in the Paiute Mesa, uh, one of the mountains was totally white. And only years later did I realize what they were doing. They took off the top of the mountain, uh, put in a, um, <clears throat> put in a, a total, uh, base underground there of where two or three thousand people work, uh, and then put the mountain top back on. They have, uh, for 12 miles north of there, they have two brand new runways, uh, oriented, uh, northeast and, uh, southwest, <clears throat> and those are to test new airplanes. That thing is totally uh, invisible by anybody who's looking from the air. Uh, you can absolutely cannot see it. And uh, it's absolutely uh, halfway between uh, Groom Lake and Dona Potestra. Now, here's the interesting thing, Jim, is they had to figure out a way to get two or three thousand people up to work. This place I call Sandia. Now, it may have a different name now, but the reason they called it Sandia is because if they gave the base a new name, it would obviously mean that there was something new going on. So what they do for all secret projects now, they give old names that are used everywhere else. For instance, Sandia, there's a Sandia Mountain Range, Sandia Corporation, Sandia everything. And so if Sandy is accidentally mentioned, somebody said, oh, I know that place. That That's in Albuquerque. But uh, so that's why I think it's called Sandy. Now, here's the interesting thing. They have to get two or 3,000 people up there. How do they do it? They can't do it with the 737s that uh, work out of special projects at uh, McCarran because they would have to get new airplanes, and they don't want any – any indication that there's a lot of people going anywhere. They can't have them drive up. It takes too long. They can't have buses. It takes too long. So what they did is they built uh, an underground maglev subway. They can go from uh, – it's under the, the main terminal is under the Luxor um, – Casino, uh, it goes to the Bellagio to pick up other passengers, and then it goes direct to Sandia in about 15 minutes. Now, the way they did that, and it's interesting now because there's a new uh, casino being built uh, right where all this construction was going on. I think it's called uh, World Casino or something like that. But what they did is they built a uh, 50-story casino called the Echelon. And they put in the construction there of uh, steel frame all the way uh, up to the 50 stories. And the specific reason for Echelon was to hide the construction of the uh, underground uh, subway because uh, you can't start under building something underground. You have to get through the top in a large area to get all the equipment down there to build it. Uh, and uh, Echelon was specifically so that the people from the Strip or anybody else uh, uh, could not see what was going on. They had CIA sharpshooters uh, stationed all around Echelon, and the workers were told specifically
specifically, under no circumstances, do you look over the side of what's going on. If you do, you'll be shot. And uh, that's what, that was what their job was. So the original entrance to the subway was <laughs> the gift shop at the Luxor. Oh, but my. then, you know, they had to get so many people that they had to get other entrances. Now there's a walkway from special projects at McCarran that goes over to the terminal under the Luxor. The reason they used Bellagio is because the massive underground parking there uh, was a place where they could hide uh, that many cars of people going to work. The people going to Bellagio, they go into a secret room, get into a secret elevator, and takes them down 100 feet to the subway there. And then they get uh, off into uh, to go to Sandia. You know, do, you John, mean the Bla- do you mean the Bellagio in Las Vegas? Do I what? Do you mean the hotel in Las Vegas, the Bellagio, or you mean another yeah. Bellagio? Yeah. No, no, the Bellagio Hotel in Vegas. In, now, in Vegas, In 1984, yeah. not, not 1984, the uh, uh, Bellagio had a three-day... Uh, blackout. Now that's absolutely impossible. Uh, Bellagio, the, the casinos have backup on um, backup on um, backup to see they don't ever lose power because of all the money that's going around, all the machines that are going around. They cannot afford that for that to happen. What they were doing is they were adding an extra track, um uh, under uh, uh, the the uh, under the Bellagio happened to be under the Bellagio, and they hit the main power grid for Bellagio and wiped out the power for uh, two, three days. Now this was a disaster because they had to get so many people involved in rebuilding it and getting that power grid going. They had to give accidental disclosures to accidental disclosure forms to all the people that Nevada Energy who had no idea that this was going on and it was a uh, uh, a real disaster an intelligence disaster uh, Bellagio was paid off to keep their mouths shut and nobody has there never been a satisfactory explanation of what caused the power out at the Bellagio for three days interesting you, you know this all does remind me of a post that you made on above top secret uh, maybe around 2007 about a Navy submarine base under the Nevada desert that's something I've always wanted to talk to you about and you reminded me about that just now. Yes, uh, I used to drive up to uh, Reno to see my folks, and halfway between Las Vegas and Reno, there's a town called Hawthorne. And right. it has a little lake there about 15 miles long, it's about 100 feet deep, and there was always a sign uh, on both ends of town saying, Navy, Naval Underwa- Underwater Warfare Training Center. Wow. And I'm wondering, now, where could they train what could they use? They're not using that lake because they won't even get a submarine in there. And uh, eventually I found out a friend of mine told me uh, that there was an elevator uh, in the uh, in the naval uh, part of uh, Hawthorne that uh, went down 3,200 feet to the Pacific Ocean. Now, the 15 western states of the United States um, f- uh, floats on the Pacific Ocean. And the Navy has entrances at Malibu and and uh, Monterey Bay, there's probably other entrances, entrances, but those are the only ones I know about. Now, it's not a tunnel. It's the whole area there. And uh, they can go wherever they want uh, under those 15 states. There's some very odd places where signs say uh, Navy underwater uh, area or something like that. They're all over the place. Uh, so they can do anything they want. Now, the reason they used Hawthorne is because Hawthorne has been the uh, area where they build uh, and construct and engineer all of the super secret uh, submarine uh, submarine uh, uh, munitions, missiles, uh, ROVs, remote operating vehicles, all that. And to, there's a mountain, a uh, huge mountain uh, uh, to the northwest of Hawthorne, and it's hidden in those mountains. And uh, you can look on uh, Google Earth, and you can follow the main road going up there, and it just disappears. <laughs> there's just, you know, it doesn't go anywhere, and it's like a four-lane, hi- a four-lane highway that goes up there. So the Navy uh, can send uh, their <clears throat> submarines under uh, through from Monterey Bay 
uh, all the way up to uh, under Hawthorne. Now, there's a huge submarine base under Hawthorne, and they can get supplied uh, with all their munitions. They don't have to go to uh, uh, go through Reno to Alameda. They don't have to go to uh, Sandia or to uh, San Diego. They can just go underground to uh, Hawthorne and get all these uh, supplies that they need. That's some wild shit, right, John? This one? I said that's pretty wild shit. <laughs> hey, it's all true. I know a lot of people no, I, no, you I know, say that. that I'm that I'm full of it, but the fact is, I don't come out with anything unless I can absolutely positively prove right, it. Right. I wasn't saying it's 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 a. I wasn't discrediting you. I was saying it's just so wild that this exists. Now, Norm Bergen, who wrote uh, Ringmakers of Saturn, uh, had a fantastic career. I mean, he worked for the, some of the major um, aerospace companies, uh, Lockheed, Douglas, all of them. And I had a chance in 1985 when I gave a, a lecture in uh, San Jose to go to his house and talk to him. And uh, I, I told him the story about that I thought that... Uh, um, uh, that, uh, let's see, not eight, and it wouldn't have been 85. I told him about the, my theory on, uh, World Trade Center being holograms. He says, oh, absolutely. He said, I was going to work, uh, on the, uh, main highway from Palo Alto, where he lived, uh, down to, uh, Lockheed. And, uh, he said, one morning, uh, 747 appeared maybe 200 feet above my car. And it stayed there for 30 seconds. It was absolutely uh, not anywhere where an airplane would be or would be that low. And he said, to me, it looked like a real 747. Uh, I think that happened in 1985. But uh, he said, I agree with you that they were holograms in uh, uh, in the use on 9-11. Now, I used to post on ATS, but they're so government controlled. Uh, when I first mentioned the hologram theory, I got attacked like you can't believe. Oh, of course. I mean, of course. Hundreds of people were on there. Yeah. And uh, I also uh, am pro Billy Meyer. Uh, that incident happened. It was real. He did get taken in a flying saucer. Now, some of the things he said are uh, maybe are not absolutely correct. Michael but the Billy Meyer story is true. And because of my insistence on that, uh, ATS just, uh, first of all, they just kicked me off. And, uh, oh, no. and then later, uh, they said, okay, you can come back on. I said, not without an apology. That's right. And uh, sept septic overlord who heads up the thing um, uh, would not give the apology. So I've never been back, and it's fine with me yeah. because there are a bunch of morons on that place. I agree. You don't need to go back there. <laughs> a bunch of morons. Whereas on uh, Facebook. You know, I can uh, uh, I can say what I want, and uh, people are willing to disagree. Of it. You know, there are plenty of trolls on there, uh, and as long as they can back up their uh, disagreement, I'm willing to let them on. But if they just go on and off about stuff they know nothing about, then I'll go ahead and block them. Right, and you usually know who knows something or not. It's quite obvious. By the way, speaking of your Facebook page, I especially like your photos with Bob Lazar. Yeah, I talked to Bob every week, and uh, he's saved my life twice in the past uh, year or so. Uh, I got, um, I was taking uh, oxycodone oh, because no, of, uh, as, as my as my health deteriorates, I had an accident in 1961, June 24th, in Geneva, Switzerland, and I accidentally spun in. Uh, I broke both legs in three places, crushed my heels, crushed my feet, uh, crushed my neck, lost all my front teeth, uh, had a concussion, broke both sides of my jaw, and I barely lived. The doctor said I would never walk again, but fortunately, I wanted to fly so bad that I worked through all of that, but now, uh, in 1974, you know, in 1974, things are starting to rapidly deteriorate, and I needed some pain relief. So, um, 
the DEA this summer uh, made an edict that uh, all people taking uh, uh, opioids had to cut uh, by half in the first month and then half of that in the second month. And so not only that, but you can't have your regular doctor do it. Uh, they have to, you have to go to a, a pain management specialist. So I go to a pain management specialist, give me urine sample, they give me a, a, a a, uh, a prescription. Two days later, they called my wife and said, your husband's testing uh, positive for methamphetamine. We can't have him in our program anymore. Oh, my God. Now, that is so absolutely ridiculous. I haven't left my dad in eight years. I don't know, wouldn't even know how to take methamphetamine, much less how to get it. So somebody spiked it. And uh, the reason is, is because if you... If you have too many medical uh, problems and you cost them money, in my case it was over half a million dollars, they decide to uh, to eliminate you, to kill you. And uh, so the people where I had my insurance program uh, were in on it. And uh, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, about, uh, you know, right after I had that uh, uh, urine sample, uh, my doctor takes it to a pharmacy, pharmacy which is totally legal under the HIPAA Act of 1996. You cannot do that. You're liable to a quarter of a million dollar fine. Uh, but this doctor took it to the pharmacy. I was no longer able to get any pain medicine. The uh, company writes me two days later, and they says because I'm taking legal drugs, they're dropping me from the program. So I went into involuntary um, detox, uh, having taken uh, opioids for the last two years, and it was the most painful thing I've ever been through. Oh, there was, I got no help from anybody at all, and I talked to Bob all the time. And and during this time, I called him and I said, you know, I'm I'm done for, Bob. And he says, let me work on this. So he uh, he did some research and found out there's a uh, vitamin called kratom that comes out of uh, Portland. And uh, he said, go get this stuff, and I've been using it ever since. And what it has, all the ingredients of oxycodone except the opioids. And uh, then uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, uh, in my uh, 74th day of a detox, I started feeling extremely weak. I couldn't use my hands. I couldn't even use a, a TV clicker. And I called him, and I said, Bob, I just I don't know what's wrong, but I'm not going to be able to make it. He said, let me work on it. So he called back and uh, said, go get this stuff at your grocery. It's called 5-HTP, and it's specifically for people who have already been through 60 days of detox uh, to help get their energy back and that's been working for me so Very nice. I talk to Bob all the time we've been friends for years he's my best friend um, he's a Jew so anybody that says I'm <laughs> anti-Semitic I tell him you know go take a flying leap that some of my best friends are uh, Jews that's so funny I, I really love Bob, Bob Lazar he's someone I've always wanted to get on the program and I'm glad you still talk to him and I'm glad he's helping you and he saved my life. Yeah, he's a really good guy. So, John, anyway, I'm working some... through this. Uh, I, I don't know whether detox could last as long, but uh, I'm working through it, and I'm still, like I said, uh, I'm up. But uh, that's about it. What, what about uh, medicinal marijuana? What, what about that? That's good. It's good for some people. It doesn't work for me. I don't like it. I don't use it. Uh -huh. uh, but I have no... Uh, uh, no problem with people that do. Uh, I'm amazed that it got approved in some states because that's the cash cow for the uh, the oh, government. Yes. Right. Uh, all illegal drugs are. So uh, the DEA uh, tried to outlaw Kratom, which is just a vitamin. It has no opioids at all in it, but they didn't like it. So they got so much protest a year ago that they backed off. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, John, I just wanted to ask, I'm sure you heard about the event with the USS Cole a couple of years ago in the Black Sea where a, a Russian is an SU-29 approached and all their fire direction, all their computerized system were frozen in place. It made repeated passes. There, there were uh, many sailors got out of the Navy because they could tell now, that, you know, that 
the 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 Donald call was a was a Donald Duck. It was a sitting duck, and I'm just wondering whether the, this uh, capacity possessed by the Russians to take control or, or neutralize all of our computerized systems aboard our warships has come to your attention. Uh, I didn't know that. I believe it. Uh, you know, this supposed Cold War, the Russians never existed. Uh, it, we were friends of the Russians all the time and still are. Uh, and uh, there is a connection there that uh, I'm still trying to figure out, Jim, and the connection is Israel is connected with Russia, is connected with the United States. Now, I don't know how it all comes together, but it's a masterful plan. Now, we know that Hitler uh, died in the United States in 1968, uh, and uh, in uh, uh, the... Uh, 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 the program Paperclip, which was managed by yes. uh, John Foster Dulles, uh, Secretary of State, Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, and their sister, Eleanor uh, Dulles, who was head of the Berlin desk. And through them, they uh, what happened was the, uh, <clears throat> the Germans knew they were going to lose. They came to the United States. They knew we couldn't make plutonium, uh, and they could make the uh, initiator, but not... Uh, uh, they could make the initiate they could make the plutonium but not the initiator so they came to us and they said we'll give you the plutonium if you'll let three to four thousand of the ss in after the war we agreed to uh and that was operation paperclip and they took over nasa uh the way uh you know the uh, israel been in full control of uh nasa and uh they killed they murdered uh grissom Chaffee and White and another secret, um, uh, secret astronaut. Now, the secret astronaut was there because the head of the Apollo program, uh, Joe, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, he had to be away that day. So they put in a secret astronaut, uh, who didn't know that, uh, they were going to murder, uh, Grissom. When they, when the fire went on and, uh, they were all killed, uh, there's a, uh, a delay of uh, of two hours uh, before they were anybody was allowed to go in and take the bodies out and do the inspection. The reason the delay was there because was because they had to get the secret astronaut out of there uh, before anybody found out. Uh, because they would have to say his name, what his background was, why he was in the capsule with Grissom, White, and Chaffee, and they couldn't afford that. So that was the mysterious two-hour delay uh, in the inspection of the uh, Apollo 1 fire. Are we there? Yeah, I, I thought Jim was going to respond to you. No. Well, I Jim, think uh, John, uh, John and I may have uh, uh, different views about the Apollo program and so forth. I'm inclined to believe the whole thing was staged. And it was a very elaborate, uh, you know, deception yeah, well, of the American people. Too. Pardon me? Where, where did I say different? Well, uh, don't you have a view about uh, the uh, the role of the moon today, John? Have I been misinformed? Tell me. It, it, uh, do you do you do you agree that the the whole moon program was a uh, was a subterfuge that it was uh, not uh, uh, possible for us to travel to the moon that we didn't have the propulsion power absolutely we didn't have positively power? you know absolutely positively uh, the Van Allen belt uh, is right. the main reason we couldn't go but the technology we never developed the Saturn V what the people saw taking off uh, on uh, on uh, Apollo eleven uh, was a Saturn four B that was dressed up to look like a Saturn V. But the fact is, of all 200 videos, uh, and there's probably more, uh, of the takeoff uh, that follow it through as far as the second stage, there was no second stage. It did not happen. The only thing is, after the first stage burned out, NASA put a little explosive in there to make people think that that was the second stage firing. But there's not one piece of credible evidence that uh, the uh, second stage fired. That whole thing was faked. I mean, there was not, no no way that we uh, they went up there. I got interested in the uh, you know the whole space program when I was in London and with my wife. We were staying at the Morgan Hotel on on 
is it Salisbury Street, as I recall the name, backs on to the British Museum, and I turned on one of the BBC channels, and they were playing conspiracy theory, did we land on the moon, which just gave one scientific argument after another about how it was an elaborately staged hoax, including in some scenes you actually see saw the astronauts were on wires. They were being controlled from above as though they were puppets. I mean, the fact there's no blast crater underneath a moon lander, you know, I... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, I mean, Jim, my forget team. all that. There's an in, uh, there's a video with, uh, what's his name? Who was the guy that uh, did 2001? Oh, uh, Kubrick. Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick. Right. There's a, there's a, a, a video on, uh, the web that shows him admitting that and telling how it happened, how he went into Nixon's office, how Nixon said, look, we got a problem, we can't get to the moon, we need you to help us. And that's when he filmed it in London. Uh, his wife and daughter all c- can uh, uh, agree that that's what he was doing there, and that's what he did. Now, Kubrick, after he did the uh, fake landings, lived in his house until his uh, until he passed away, and he never went out of there. Uh, the plan was to kill him, uh, but they couldn't get to him. Yeah, very interesting, just stunning stuff. In fact, re- recently, I think about two years ago, a NASA spokesman said that the greatest obstacle to a manned mission to Mars was the Van Allen radiation belt, as though that were a novelty. <laughs> Uh, there was a discovery of a treasure trove of moon landing uh, footage. NASA destroyed it, John. And most recently, they offered $20,000 for assistance with their space poop problem that currently they could handle human waste up to 14 days, uh, 14 hours worth. But, of course, some of these flights allegedly took seven or eight days. So, you know, they had a uh, – it turns out the whole space program was nothing but a massive pile of space poop. Absolutely, and the forty billion dollars that we spent on that went to uh, the or the uh, weapons of mass destruction that we have orbiting. There's fifteen of them. Uh, you just go to John Walsom, that's W A L S O N, on the web, and he's got fantastic pictures of these. Uh, weapons orbiting. He has a telescope that was able to, uh, uh, to be able to track these things, and I have pictures of at least 15 of them. So, you know, uh, they're up there, that's what the money was used, uh, and we cannot go any further, we could not go any further than the Van Allen belt. Now, we are allied with uh, some of the ETs who have given us help uh, in these uh, weapons and uh, other areas, and and, uh, and uh, they're the only ones that could help us get past the Van Allen belt. Now, on the moon, I know it's uh, not believable, but uh, I know that the gravity is 68.71% of Earth. It's not 16%. There is a breathable atmosphere, and I believe that a quarter of a million, a quarter of a million humans live up there. I have pictures of all kinds of stuff up there. I have... Uh, 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 pictures of spaceports, uh, pictures of mining in uh, the uh, crater Copernicus. Uh, you can go to thelivingmoon.com, find all those pictures, look at them yourself. Uh, I posted a lot of that on uh, Facebook. Uh, I posted a picture the other day of Aristarchus. Now, Aristarchus always been told us by NASA, told us that uh, it's just bright sand. Well, it may be bright sand, but there's a structure 25 miles in diameter, hexagonal structure, that's absolutely enormous. And there's a blue glow from there, and the blue glow comes, or it can come from radioactive uh, material getting in contact with air, which turns it blue, and that's called the Tarankov effect. And I posted a picture of that, and uh, everybody looks at that and says, oh, my God, I guess the moon's not ours. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> <Right>. not ours. <laughs> you, you know, this reminds me of a talk I had with Dr. Albert Taylor, who, you know, we talked off air, and he sort of alluded to what you're saying now, remarkably. So, yeah, John, so, John, look, that they, if they, we, they've been we, said so much BS over the uh, over the years, especially this gravity thing. Right. Uh, now, there's a lady called, uh, her name is Perry Spalter. She wrote, wrote The Gravitational Force of the Sun in 1993, and she absolutely proves mathematically, scientifically, and every other way that Newton was wrong. Is not there, there's no gravitational pull in mass, and because that's true, then everything that uh, Einstein came.
came up with, uh, both general and special uh, relativity uh, theories, all of that is out the window. There's not a shred of truth of any of it. Oh, man. John, let me ask you this. I mean, if the, we, we've had to fake the space program and traveling to the moon in 1969-1970, how are we able to maintain bases there now? What is the mode of transportation? Uh, do we do we succeed in discovering how to do this subsequent to the original space program? Or think, is there, what makes you think there, we have a base there? Yeah, but how did we manage to get there to develop the base? Yeah, well, what makes you think we have a base there? Oh, I thought you were asserting we did. No. I said there's a quarter of a billion humans up there, but they aren't from Earth. They're from somewhere else. Ah, um, this is an alien base. Ah. Absolutely. Because, uh, I mean, the now temperature they, uh, variation is like from 350 above to 350 below. I mean, you know, this is a there's huge no, that's all, very, very Jim, that's all environment for human, human beings. Jim, that's all BS. Don't believe any of that stuff that NASA says. Howard Menger went there in 1956. Uh, the moon people have taken hundreds, thousands of people from Earth up to sea and take a tour there of two weeks showing all the stuff they have. But, of course, they're not going to say anything because nobody would believe them. But Howard Menger went up there in 1956, came back. Uh, he became a uh, confidant of the Pentagon, uh, and he's the one that, uh, when I got interested in the moon stuff, I wanted to know the true color of the sky, and he said it's saffron yellow. And I said uh, I sent him a uh, uh, six swatches of different colors of saffron yellow, and had him mark the one that, that the color of the sky was. And I have that posted on the Living Moon that he did that. Now he's passed away. Now he had a website, and apparently it's not going anymore. His daughter used to run it, but. Uh, Howard Menger went there uh, on one of the trips that they gave him was uh, out in the desert on a, uh, a high-speed maglev train or whatever it was. He said, uh, uh, yeah, a train um, that ran on a copper highway. He said when they were in the desert, they were allowed, they opened the doors and they were allowed to go out and see. Yes, it was hot, but it, it wasn't any fatal hot. So... You know, all that stuff you hear from NASA, there's not one shred of truth. And as far as uh, big gas giants in the uh, solar system, uh, the only gas giant in our solar system is NASA. Now, unbeknownst to uh, most people, they think there's nine planets. There's 40 planets uh, in our solar system, and they all trade with one another. Uh, they trade, you know, along with our moon. Uh, they, uh, the people on the moon farm, and they uh, also mine minerals. And all that trading goes on all the time. And we're all sitting on Earth thinking, gee, I wonder if anybody's out there. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. By the way, uh, John, I, I did want to get your opinion on Elon Musk. He's been making the waves lately. Um, any opinion on him, sir? Uh, refresh my memory. What does he say? Elon Musk is someone who wants to colonize Mars. Um, you know, all of our planets are col uh, have civilizations on them. All, of, all 40 planets have civilizations. Mars has at least two or three civilizations on there. There's no way that we're going to get up there uh, and, and create any uh, any of our stuff up there. There's too much stuff going on up there. Now, we're told that uh, Mars doesn't have a breathable atmosphere. That's baloney. We're told that they don't have water. That's baloney. Everything you hear from NASA, there's not one shred of truth that comes out of that company. Never a straight answer. And, and by the way, we have a caller here. Star, go ahead and ask John or Jim a question. Hi, good evening, Mike, John, and Jim. Uh, I haven't felt well, so I'm just going to throw this out there and hang up and listen to the answer. I just finished watching a video uh, by Elena Freeland or Freeman, I believe, on a book that's coming out in January called Under an Ionized Sky. Uh, speaking of CERN, HARP, all different kinds of things, geostorm, geoengineering, and because of the ionized sky, uh, they are able to use holograms <clears throat> they project onto the sky, and the ionized sky holds the image. Uh, I'm wondering uh, what you know about any of this and how this relates to any of the topics you were speaking about tonight, especially 
uh, the hologram planes in 911. Was the sky ionized then? How did that all work? And thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Yes, that's possible to happen. Uh, but, you know, uh, all of this stuff about Nibiru and Planet X and all that, it's all BS. Nothing's going to happen to us. There's no asteroids going to hit us. No, nothing. We were created by ET. Uh, they're in control. They made billions and billions of humans before. Earth is 13 billion years old, and there have been many thousands of civilizations far more advanced than we are on Earth. And uh, when they're due, when they're done with that particular project, they erase it. They completely uh, turn the planet uh, over with uh, dirt and water and everything, and then start a new one. And we're just in a long line uh, of, uh, of uh, humans uh, uh, on Earth. Now, the reason humans are on Earth is because all of us have lived hundreds of lifetimes. Nobody has, uh, this is their first time. There, we're on Earth because in our last lifetime, we made an error. We did something wrong. And Earth is essentially a prison planet. We're here to live, to learn how to live with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed, and to express our love to our family each and every day. That's all we've got to do. We don't have to make money. We don't have to collect uh, girlfriends. We don't have to do any of that stuff that people think is important. All we have to do is live with integrity, without envy, hate, or greed, and to express our love to our family each and every day. That's it. That's a great answer. I hope that answered her question. And, Jim, are you still there? Well, I'm uh, I'm uh, old-fashioned compared to John's paradigm. Mine is far more traditional of a, an Earth that's approximately four and a half billion years old where, where gravity no is way. a bona fide no phenomenon way. qualified by... Qualified by <laughs> Einstein and special and general relativity. So John had, and where evolution was the origin of, of, of life on earth, but I'm fascinated by John's declarations, which I'm not in a position to verify or confirm. I find it Jim, just fascinating. Go, just buy Perry Spalter's book. It's out there. You can order it or publishing in Granite Hills. Just read the book and see the evidence she's had. She's a mathematical genius and she shows why Newton was wrong. It's very easy to understand. Uh, I'll tell you, it's so easy to understand that I could understand it. <laughs> her, her name again, John, the name of the book again. Her last name is Spolter, S-P-O-L-T-E-R, and her first name is Perry, P-A-R-I. Yeah, P-A-R-I. I'll look into that. And uh, by the way, John, are, are you in your infamous lair while we're conducting this yes. interview? Yeah, oh, I'm yeah. always in my infamous lair. I, I love that place, by the way. Looking at the photos now, um, has it changed over the years at all? Yeah, I just finished doing um, the hallway completely. Uh, on one side of the hallway is uh, all of the uh, nice letters I've gotten uh, from people, and the other side is just all the great pictures I have on the moon. I have the, the spaceport there. I have uh, uh, pictures of all kinds of things. I have pictures of, of landing in Mogadishu. You know, I was the first one to be in Somalia in 1977 when we, we went there. I say the U.S. Uh, when I say we, I mean the U.S. Yes. What happened was is the uh, traditional supported by Russia, East Bloc uh, uh, countries, and uh, for some reason the Russians decided to support the Ethiopian uh, rebels, and this made Somalia so uh, angry that uh, uh, that they kicked them out, kicked the Russians out. We went in there, and uh, what we wanted was Berbera, the deep water port on the uh, mouth of the uh, uh, Gulf of Aden that leads up to the Red Sea. The reason that's important is because it's the Straits of Hormuz to the north uh, where all oil comes out of. If that's ever uh, 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 blocked for some reason, all of the uh, oil has to go down to Yanbu. That's Y-A-N-B-U on the uh, coast of the Red Sea. And then all the oil will have to go out through the Gulf of Aden. So it's important that we have a presence and, uh, uh, and a presence and port Berbera, uh, on the Gulf of Aden. Now, I was the first one in uh, 1977. I got a call from a, a guy uh, 
John, we need a 707 captain. Uh, uh, can you work for us? And I said, yeah, what are we doing? He said, I can't tell you. I said, okay, well, uh, he said, go to Frankfurt. And he said, check in the International Hotel there, and uh, I'll call you. So I said, well, how am I supposed to get paid for this? And he said, uh, I'll have cash for you then. So I got a friend, uh, got a uh, plane to Frankfurt, went there, checked in the hotel. I get a message, go down to Lufthansa, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. There's a flight to Budapest, and uh, everything will be handled. The ticket's paid for, uh, everything. So I go down there and find eight other of my fellow uh, pilots who I didn't know were there, are doing the same thing. So we go to Budapest, we get, uh, you know, Air Americans are supposed to, uh, Americans aren't supposed to go into uh, Hungary, uh, but there was a CIA gear there walking us through. We went to the Hilton Hotel, we checked in, and uh, there's a phone call, go to room such and such uh, at uh, 8 o'clock. And so we all go up there, and there's a guy in there. His name is Hank Wharton. He was the premier uh, State Department gun runner of the uh, 70s. And uh, he gives us a briefing, and he starts out, Now, welcome to uh, Budapest. Buda is on the north side of the Danube. Uh, Danube. Uh, Pest is on the south side. Uh, you'll find that uh, in October here, it's going to be a little cooler, but it's still pleasant weather. Da-da-da-da-da. And as he's doing this, he has a piece of paper with a, a typewritten bunch of rules and regulations. And he he passes it to each person uh, so that we can read it while he's giving this, uh, this travelogue. And it says, you know, common stuff like, don't trade money on the black market. Don't tell anybody why you're here. You know, that kind of stuff. I still have that captain's brief, and it's in the hallway on, on the table there in my scrapbook of uh, interesting things. So he finishes the briefing. He says, now, come on, I'm going to buy you dinner. So we go out, and he takes us over the chain bridge, that famous iron chain bridge that uh, crosses the Danube. We get to the middle of it. Of course, there's nobody there, and he tells us what we're doing. He says, uh, tomorrow morning, or actually it was the, the day after, uh, he said, we're going to uh, have the airplane loaded uh, with guns and ammunition, and uh, you'll fly him to Somalia. And uh, <clears throat> We stopped in Saudi Arabia for fuel. I had to make a fuel stop, and then after uh, after uh, 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 Jeddah, uh, we flew to Somalia. I think it's a three or four hour trip, and uh, radio silence. Nobody. The only clearance we got from Jeddah was cleared for takeoff, <laughs> oh and we started flying south. We get to Somalia, and uh, there's all kinds of Americans here ready to unload these uh, guns and ammunition. And the reason it had to come with Hungary is because Somalia was traditionally supported by East Bloc countries, uh, which is all a different caliber. So if we're going to support them uh, like we wanted to when they kicked the Russians out, we're going to have to get ammunition that fits their guns. And the way we did it was to, to get it through Hungary. So that went on for a couple of months, and that was uh, an interesting part of my career. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I kind of really enjoyed that. That's wild stuff. I didn't know about any of that, uh, John. Pardon? I said I didn't know about any of that. Yeah, and uh, I can tell it now because uh, all the people that uh, were in that program or any program that I talk about are, you know, are passed away, so I don't have too much problem here, and that may be why they haven't bumped me off yet. Yeah, that, that that's probably why exactly. And of course, I, I did see that drawing that Bob Lazar made for you on your uh, um, Facebook there. Oh yeah, of the um, of the Aurora. Yes, of the Aurora. Yeah, yeah. He saw the Aurora. Everybody says, "Oh, it didn't exist. It was a accidental um, accounting error that made that." But they made seven of them, and Bob saw one of them on the ramp uh, at Groom Lake. Now he didn't work at Groom Lake; he worked at S four, and uh, he would take the uh, seven thirty seven uh, to Groom Lake, get into a bus that take uh, thirty minutes to get to S four out in the desert on uh, Papoose Lake, and uh, he would work all day there, then come back. And and uh, again, now in March 21st of 1989, he said, "Do you want to see a flying saucer fly?" And I said, "Yeah, how can we do it?" He said, "There's a test flight tomorrow night. 
and I know where we can get in, still be on public land, and watch it fly. And I said, great, let's go. So I went with uh, Bob and uh, Gene Huff and uh, Bob's wife. We go up there, uh, get there about 9 o'clock. I'm setting up a telescope, and there it is, right to the south, where, where it would be over S4, Papham's Lake. This thing gets up and uh, lights up the, uh, it's a ball of light. It goes up, and then it starts going to the right and left and zipping all around, and it's pretty fantastic. And then uh, I had a Celestron 8 telescope, which is very difficult uh, to focus in on anything that's been moving, but I got it focused in, and as it's coming down, uh, straight down behind the mountains for a landing, I saw it clear as a bell through this 8-inch telescope. It was a flying saucer. It was colored goldish. It was radiating some kind of gold material off the uh, outside of it, and I watched it for maybe 15 seconds. Uh, I moved over. I said, Gene, look at this, and as I pulled back, I accidentally hit one of the tripod legs uh, and moved it out of position. But uh, they all went a week later and uh, saw it. I was on a flight with American Trans Air at the time. Uh, and then the week after that was uh, March 6, 1989. Uh, and as we drove in, uh, we got security. Uh, and uh, they asked for IDs and all this stuff, you know, and kept us for, oh, yes. detained us for an hour. Um and said, you know, don't come back, and uh, we drove <laughs> right. out on the, the highway, and we were stopped by uh, Lane County uh, Sheriff, and he gave us the business for about an hour, and then finally, he comes back, he says, I don't know why I'm being told to tell you this, but I'm telling you that I'm releasing you, no further questions, and that don't come back again. So the next day, uh, Bob, uh, his boss was Dennis Mariana, uh, said, Bob, uh, don't go to the 737 today. I'm going to come and pick you up. I picked him up. I took him to, uh, which is now um, Creech Air Force Base, uh, and they took him out of the car with a gun in his ear, took him into security. Creech is where the his security is for the entire Nevada test site, and they said, now, Bob, when we gave you a clearance, to work on these flying saucers, it didn't mean you were supposed to take all of your friends out there and watch it. <laughs> now, do you want to work <laughs> here or not? And uh, there was some other problems, but Bob was noncommittal. And the reason he was noncommittal is because the last two trips up to Groom Lake and S4, he could remember getting on the airplane at McCarran and getting off after the day was over, off the same airplane at McCarran. But he couldn't remember anything that went on between, and he didn't want to work on a program uh, where you weren't allowed to remember what you were doing. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So, so, I you know, understand then that the, the U.S. has anti-gravity uh, technology, or these uh, flying saucers, these were of U.S. Uh, origin rather than extraterrestrial. Is that correct? Were the saucers of extraterrestrial pro- uh no, these were, were yeah. these U.S. contrivances, the saucers you no, were no, doing no. here? No, no, they were nine extraterrestrial craft. They and, were nine uh, extraterrestrial his craft. Job, his job was to back engineer uh, the propulsion system, but it's trillions of years ahead of us. There's no way that we could even possibly the fuel is element 115. Uh, we've been allegedly been able to make it, but we can't make the 115 that he held. It doesn't have the number of isotopes it should have. And uh, there is absolutely no way that we could make 115. Now, the ETs gave us 500 pounds of that uh, to use, but the only thing we figured out uh, is to use it as a bomb. And if he used all 500 pounds of element 115, uh, shot protons at it and exploded it, it would, it, it would destroy an area the size of South America. But we don't have it. You're not really intelligent people that are running the program up there, so I can see why Bob didn't want to stay there. Yeah. Can you t- uh, elaborate on what happened, uh, you know, at Roswell, what, what, 1947 or so when we had the, the you know, reports of a, of a saucer having crashed there and the discovery of two or three aliens maybe still alive at the time. Can you expound on that? Yeah, there was two saucers that crashed. Uh, there was uh, 
four alien beings. Uh, they're what we call the Greys. They are androids. They're not an ET race. Uh, they are just kind of like uh, workers that work for ETs. Good ETs, bad ETs, it doesn't matter. They, they're just workers. Those were specifically caused crashes so that we could take some of the information and uh, use it for technology. But as far as anti-gravity, now my father, the head of Lear Incorporated, which he formed in 1930 after he sold his interest, uh, his half interest in Motorola, uh, he took that money formed Lear Incorporated, and it was a very successful uh, corporation uh, uh, giving all kinds of products to the military. In 1952, he was given the entire anti gravity program uh, to work on. And that program was finished and complete in 1956. We had all our own saucers. We had our own anti-gravity. Now, not as sophisticated as ETs have, but uh, we could certainly use it. We could certainly have our own flying saucers. Unfortunately, Dad couldn't keep his mouth shut, and in 1953, he was kicked out of the program. And even though he was president and chairman of the board of Lear Inc., he was not allowed to get into that program. And uh, he never said another word. Uh, he died in 1978. And I'm sure that the briefing they gave him was, now, Bill, you're talking too much. You're no longer in the program. If you say one more word about it, we're going to kill Moya, his wife. We're going to kill your kids. We're going to kill your grandparents. We're going to kill your parakeet, your dog, and everything else. So Jesus. keep your mouth shut. And he never said wow. it. That's pretty heavy. Yeah, that's the way they threaten people today. That's why a lot of people aren't coming out is because they don't care about their own lives. They may be, you know, dying of some kind of thing, but they say, when you're gone, you know, we find out you said anything, your family is history. Oh, no. Well, I'm glad you John, didn't meet that I'd like to return to a political issue which has to do with the vast influence of Israel over our political system. What we can, what can we do to modify or eradicate that influence, which is all for the using the United States, its resources, its finances, its military to benefit Israel? They could care less about us, but only as a resource for the sake of which, of course, 9/11 was organized so that we would. Enter the Middle East to take out the modern Arab states that served as a counterbalance to Israel's domination of the region. Uh, how how can we you know divest ourselves of this cancer on our body politic? Jim, we can't. I'm telling you, the only thing we have to do is live our lives with integrity, without envy, hate, or greed, and to express our love to our family each and every day. Uh, we can't change anything else the only person we can change is ourselves understood and I, I do want to apologize i wish i could go on longer but we are coming to a close here jim if you have any more questions to ask please feel free to do so and once again i do thank john for being a part of the program oh yeah it's terrific i mean john's an invaluable resource he's a national treasure he is the greatest pilot the world has ever known uh, he has Realms of information about, you know, matters of which I am completely unaware and, and I just find all of this utterly fascinating. Oh, it was uh, amazing. I'm going to have to bring him back. We I just want to say, Jim, it's an honor to be on with you and to listen to you and, and talk to you. I've, uh, you've been my hero for a long time. I haven't read the book yet on uh, Sandy Hook, but uh, I intend to shortly. Well, that, that the original John is actually downloadable for free because yeah. Amazon banned it uh, less than a month after it went on sale on the twenty second of October two thousand fifteen. Okay, that's what I can afford. Uh, if it's not a, a, <laughs> a representative from Inside Edition said they wanted to interview me, but it was a ruse. They said they needed a pre-interview, and I found myself in what I'm. Convinced was a basement in Langley where I was being grilled about the book and <laughs> after I just blown the case out of the water, they made the decision to ban it. But That's I released funny. it immediately for free as a PDF. So you can, you can get the first edition of the book, John, uh, for free. Uh, just enter Nobody Died at Sandy Hook. A friend of mine believes that, you know, maybe 10 million Copies of this have been downloaded, which obviously is overwhelmingly more than would ever have been sold. Okay, well, Jim, uh, I'm not very bright. Can you tell me how to get to the uh, where I need to download this thing? 
just just go on to your browser and just enter the title. It'll automatically show up, John. I could just. And the title is. Uh, no but the title is died at Sandy Hook. If you can't find it, John, I'll email you a link. Okay, email yeah. it to me because I can't yeah. hear him. Yeah, I'll just email you a link. And and by the way, John, uh, Peter Robbins wanted me to say hello to you. Okay, great. I haven't seen him in a long time. That's what he told me. He hasn't seen you, and he was excited that you were going to be on the first half. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to be on the second half here. Well, I've enjoyed it. Thanks, you both of you guys. It's been great. And uh, if you want me back, just yeah, we'll, give me a call. Yeah, we'll do it again. This was fun, and so much to get into. Okay, guys. Take it easy. All right. Take care, John. Don't forget, John. Bye. Bye. Nice. Real pleasure. And there he goes, Mr. John Lear. Very, very good interview there. It was fantastic well, to talk to him. Guy, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge to appraise everything we hear from John because, you know, there's so many areas there's so where much. he's an in, in, yeah. indisputed expert about aircraft and flight and, you know, he's uh, uh, become involved in areas which are utterly foreign to me, you know, about the, the moon, uh, extraterrestrials, uh, all of that is, is, Something that uh, is just beyond my ken. It's mind blowing, really. Well, yeah, it's fascinating, utterly fascinating. I was I visited his website at the time when he was talking about it, and I made note of this uh, book. But you know, I mean, I earned my PhD in the history and the philosophy of science, and uh, the history of science is dominated by the history of physics and astronomy, of course. Right. You know. I mean, Copernicus, uh, Galileo, Kepler, the greats, Newton, the greats. You know, Einstein. These are major players in the history of science. And mm-hmm. you know, when he cites a source, that suggests they have everything wrong. I mean, that, that's tough for me to, to oh, believe. Yeah. It challenges I mean, your whole paradigm. Well, of course, and that's why I specifically put it that way. So oh, yes. you know. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll poke around and take a look. I've already sent a friend of mine who's a physicist and a very good colleague uh, a link to the book, which I tracked immediately on Amazon.com. But I would have added to John, mm-hmm. um, but apparently couldn't hear that. You know, there's a, a second edition of the Sandy Hook book, and also books about the Boston bombing. And the I'll, s- I'll send them. Yeah, I'll send them all those links. And of Ooh, course, that, yeah, that, yeah. All at moonrockbooks.com where we have a new book on Charlottesville that'll be out in the next 10 days, by the way. Nice. Uh, by the Charlottesville way. Charlottesville was a complete scam. Uh, it it mm-hmm. was a, a, a stage production in three acts. They had a, a torch lit parade onto the campus of the University of Virginia Friday night, but that was just to draw the attention of the country to the, to the community. Uh, then they yes. had this. The, the Charlottesville police were ordered to stand down so the protesters could be channeled by the state police into a direct and violent confrontation with the Antifa and Black Lives Matter, who were brought there by George Soros. Meanwhile, they had a completely fabricated stunt on an intersection there in town uh, where they had, when, when you study, you find there were two cars, uh, w- w- both of Dodge Challengers, one had a black stripe, one didn't, one had a sunroof, one didn't. Two drivers, one of whom was a 20-year-old Patsy, diagnosed as a schizophrenic on anti-drug medication, who wore heavy prescription glasses. The other, a 32-year-old, very fit m- military guy who commands a battalion in, in Ohio, who is actually the driver. And, and then there were, were multiple takes to get it right. One was with only one vehicle. Another with no others in the vicinity. Other was with one vehicle with a black Toyota. But the piece de resistance was a cl- collision involving three vehicles, a maroon van that had been sitting at the intersection for five minutes with no driver. They brought up a white van behind it at the time of the collision, no driver. Then he drove the vehicle into it. They photoshopped uh, the spectacular photograph that was on the cover of the New York Times, for example, with people flying in the air. Nothing like that happened. Right. Even the, even the two pilots who are supposed to have died in the helicopter crash, the plane did crash, but they survived it. We have photographs of them in their flight suits walking away from the scene. I mean, the, the whole thing was outrageous. Yeah, the whole a, thing is. 